All right, we've got a healthy contingent of folks who have joined and more coming in by the second. Welcome. We are so pleased to have you here. My name is Joe Swimmer. I'm the Executive Director of Episcopal Parish Network. Um, we are thrilled to bring this conversation to you today, another one of our digital workshops. Um, greetings from Kansas City, where we have just begun planning the annual conference uh, that will take place here next February 25th through 28th, where similar conversations take place. If you haven't been to one of our conferences, we invite you to learn more as we release more information about it over the summer. Um, but uh, in the interim, we are grateful to our panelists who have joined us today to share a bit of their wisdom. And um, this will be recorded in the PowerPoint and the recording will be sent to all those who are registered uh, probably tomorrow morning, if not before. It will also be housed on Episcopal Parish Network's website, and um, you are welcome to share it with your networks. We invite you to share it with your networks. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Marshall, and thank you all. Thank you, panelists, for joining us. We look forward to a stimulating conversation. Great. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to participate and to, to talk about this subject, which is, I think, very, very important to me. I also want to express my gratitude to Phil and to Laura, who are joining us today. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from them later on in the program, but it's been great getting to know a lot about both of their parishes. Um, I do want to, before we dive in, uh, Laura, I know that all of us are going to join with you and the entire Charlotte community in lifting up our prayers to the family members of the law enforcement officers who were uh, slain earlier. So um, I know Charlotte's been going through a, a tough time and we're thinking about you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I am now going to do the magic of Zoom and share my screen, which hopefully will work. Share. And there it is. Awesome. OK, so ourselves here we are in the zoom in the zoom community here um I, I it is very exciting to be here with you all today all right i need to let's see there it goes all right um just a really quick snapshot it's really easy to see why why phil and laura are on this because they've got great roles at their own parishes um i am a longtime parishioner at christ church in georgetown in washington dc but i've been in the philanthropy world for 30 some years uh, I work with nonprofit organizations, and I also work with foundations and other donors, helping them to you know, make sure they're giving their money away smartly. So I bring kind of a lot of uh, my, my faith life and my personal professional life into this. And I was also, for a number of years, was the chair of the Stewardship Commission for the Diocese of Washington. So I've been talking about the you know, funds and the church and mission for, for, for quite some time. Uh, one thing I just want to note that as I do this, I'm going to use the word mission committee very generically. So, you know, essentially, you know, your your parish may have a different name for a different title for it, but I'm just using mission committee in a very uh, sort of a general sense. Um, I'm going to go through my slides pretty quickly because I really want to hear from the panelists. I've got a, you know, a number of things that I want to raise and bring up and some questions to pose and Frankly, I hope that you know it will be things that you will take back to your parish and start some conversations. But I just I want to re reinforce that this is actually really very important. You know, mission and outreach are central to what we do. Worship on Sundays is critical. It's the first. You know, it's where everything starts. But really, the communities don't get transformed until we walk out the door of the church and begin to be the body of Christ in the community. And so I think that it is really important that we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we're doing our mission and our outreach and the ways we we're oper operationalizing it. And this is something for all parishes. This is not this is more than just about money. It is about engagement. And this is something that parishes of any size and any type of community can undertake. So I really want to reinforce that. So as I said, you know, I'm I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly and what I will confess right off is that I don't have all the answers. I just know a lot of the probing questions to ask. I've worked with and seen a lot of parishes, but my again, my goal is really to get everyone thinking uh, and you all will get this PowerPoint presentation afterwards. And we certainly can go back and talk about any of this that you see later on in the presentation or even you know follow up. My contact information will be there. So there is no one right or wrong way that this can happen. Again, each parish is gonna come to this in kind of a different way, different, you know, different angle. But I think that 
whatever you're doing and however you're doing it, I think it's really important to have clear objectives. Um, if I were to, you know, ask each one of you, what is your parish doing for mission and outreach? If you all can't answer that question in a fairly easy or concise, or if I had multiple people from your parish consistent way, then you might want to take a pause and say, well, okay, what are our objectives? You can have lots of them. I've thrown a few examples up there, but you really want to make sure that you have an objective in mind. One of the things that I know a lot of parishes do is that they use some type of a framework or guidelines like the marks of mission, or they create a mission outreach statement or a pledge as ways to guide and provide a little, a little shape. So again, think about what you're doing and you know how you're organizing that uh, in a way that kind of provides you with some structure, which is frankly one of the things that I do get asked is, well, how organized does this really need to be? You know, we're just getting the work done and that's fantastic. But I do think that having some structure in place and a structure that you can actually describe, I think, you know, really is going to help you and your mission work to see who's doing what, who's doing what, when, what kind of processes, you know, are you know, working with the church office, various, you know, how do you interface with the vestry? I think that having a structure is important. You know, it's really helpful. I mean, it can, again, it can show you a, a you know map of what to do and when to do it. It's also much easier to scale up or scale down. I mean, as your parish is growing, and hopefully it is, you know, you may want to expand and broaden your outreach. So again, having a structure gives you a framework within which you can expand that. Structure, however, does not mean rigid or without passion. I get asked by lots of nonprofits who sort of say, well, why do I have to have you know, policies and procedures, uh, and all that, does that mean we're not going to be a cool, funky nonprofit anymore? No. I think having you know, flexibility within a structure is one of the best ways to manage any type of program. And so, again, I think that there is plenty of room for the Holy Spirit to be present in part of your work, even if you have a, 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 st a structure in place. Again, I think that's going to make everyone's uh, job uh, much, much easier. And speaking of jobs, your mission committee has got a lot on its plate. Think about all that they are being asked to do when they're at your parish. There's a lot going on there. You know, they've become kind of the champions for your outreach work. They're evaluating potential nonprofit partners, you know, who, who want to work with or perhaps receive a grant from your parish. They're the ones interfacing with the organizations and with other committees or with the vestry or with stewardship. They've got a lot of work to do. And so, you know, my question for all of you is to, and to go back to your own parishes, what are you doing to equip those committee members to be successful? How are you setting your mission committee up for success? And are you taking the time and putting the effort in to orient them and to train them and to provide them with their own kind of leadership development? This is a lot, you know, we ask a lot of this committee and I think it's important that we provide them with some of the background and education that enable them to, to be successful in this work. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time evaluating the nonprofit sector and evaluating nonprofits in the Washington, D.C. area, but I think that it's not something that everyone, you know, does automatically. And so if you're trying to figure out, well, what are the needs of the community or how, am I present to the community to even know what the needs are? Again, you need to be able to set your committee up to be able to do that and, and do it successfully. One of the big questions and one of the original drivers of, you know, why this was, you know, why I actually brought this whole webinar idea up was a lot of parishes do use funding and grants as a part of their ministry and outreach program. If you do, and if you have, you know, whether your gifts are large or small or something in between, I think that it's really important that if you do have some sort of a process, that that process is easily understood, that it's a transparent process, and also that it's and it's equitable. The processes can take lots of different shapes and sizes, depending on your parish's history, capacity, the way you engage with the community. Again, I've, I've even listed some, you know, op, you know op, options here. A lot of parishes just simply it's parishioners themselves who bring the I, here's a nonprofit I want us to engage with or others the nonprofits actually have to apply with a form some of them you know you get re vestry recommendations but whatever the process is I think it's important 
again, that it's an equitable process and that it's very, very transparent, that people understand what's going on and, you know, and, how, and how this process is happening. A lot of other ways, you know, you need to look at this and if you are giving grants is to also, you know, take the time to make sure that you and the committee and your parish understands where these funds come from. Again, no one right way or wrong way to do it. Some parishes pull it directly out of their ongoing operating budget. Others, as we will see, actually do a separate event to raise money for their outreach. Some have an endowment that they can draw off of that's designated for, uh, for mission outreach. Or there's sometimes a combination of both of people use the, you know, their you know, Easter special offering or Christmas special offering to fund particular outreach efforts. But again, I think it's important that you, a parish, and your mission committee understands where that's coming from and how that budget is put together. There are also a lot of ways you can disperse those funds. Again, you know, I know some that give them, you know, single checks. I know, you know, places that also you know, want to kind of give the check or present the check in a meeting of this nonprofit, again, to really reinforce that connection between these nonprofit organizations and the church as being part of the community. There's also a lot of uh, you know, discernment that organizations do and uh, churches and community foundations all have to do this is to figure out, all right, here's our budget. What's kind of our operating principles? Are we going to do a lot to a, a, you know, to a few or are we going to spread the dollars out to a whole lot of organizations, even though the dollar figures may not be particularly large? Again, no right or wrong way to do it, but it is one of the many things that you can think about doing you may just want to spread your your outreach budget out to a whole lot of different organizations that basically say, we know you're out there. We think you're doing great work and thank you for being part of the community. We're part of the community with you. Other options, again, would be to not support as many organizations, but support them with larger gifts that might have a bigger impact or a deeper impact. Again, lots of different options and there's no one right or way, but again, you should take the time to think it through and you know what is our principle as a as a parish. And if we do have some sort of a structure in place, which again, I hope you will do or have already, is to answer the question, is it working? Is this achieving what you were hoping to achieve? You know, is you know, If you've got a structure, it, it makes it so much easier to identify and evaluate, are we achieving the goals of those objectives that we set for ourselves? Did things go as planned? If we look back at a calendar year or a school year or a fiscal year, however it's organized, did it go like we thought it was going to go to? Or or did something unforeseen happen? And wow, I'm so glad we had a plan. At least we knew we could deviate from the plan and get ourselves back on track. What sort of metrics do you use? Do you get data or information from the nonprofits you're supporting so you can really point at, look at all the people we housed or the people we fed or the families we you know, helped to you know, reach safety, whatever it was, do you use those kind of metrics or do you use stories? What are the stories that you want to be able to tell because you know your mission strategy is working? And that's a process where you have to collect those stories and be able to share them in ways that will help people to, again, understand and appreciate what's going on. I also think it's important, whether it's a formal process or not, to take a pause and occasionally check in and say, is the relationship working between us and these nonprofits? Are they getting out of the relationship what they were expecting? And is the parish, are you getting out of that relationship what you were hoping to? Lastly, I just want to remind you and reinforce the importance of keeping your whole parish connected. Don't wait till the annual meeting to tell everyone what the mission committee has been up to and here are the groups that we supported. Keep in touch with them all the time. You know, your mission committee are the stewards of these resources, both volunteer as well as financial, that are going out in the community. And you, again, in the you know, interest of transparency, you want to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. And there are so many ways to do it, whether it's you know, Sunday bulletin updates or you know, including people in your intercessions, ministry fairs, or inviting the leaders of these nonprofits to come to your coffee hour all sorts of ways. So again, lots of ways, and I will actually will raise a few of these uh, a little later in the presentation, but again, keep your parish connected. That's gonna be really, really important for the overall success of your program. So that's enough from me, and that's a lot I've thrown at you. And again, I'm happy to go back to, to talk about some of this stuff later, but I really want you to hear from our panelists 
Um, I, again, am so grateful to Phil and to Laura who have joined us and are gonna talk about what they do in their parishes. And I'm gonna actually start, uh, Laura, with you. Thank you again. And so tell us about what Christ Church Charlotte is doing. And, and you've shared some basic points uh, that they, our participants can see, but tell us about what you all are up to. Well, thank you. First of all, I am just so grateful um, to be here. I, I often tell folks that um, I feel like I have my dream job, um, getting to uh, do this work at Christ Church and in Charlotte. Um, Charlotte is a, a really great city um, for um, outreach because, well, there's great need. I wish there wasn't, but like so many places there is, but the faith community works together really well with our local government and our nonprofits. Um, and and we just we just really have a great um, a, a great community um, serving those in need in Charlotte, which is, has been very rewarding. Um, we came together last night, in fact, um, in prayer. Um, that, that said, we also are a very philanthropic and generous community, and that is absolutely true of Christ Church Charlotte. So um, for years and years and years, really the culture at Christ Church has been to, to, to do the work um, in the community of outreach. So um, I have been able to do that work for eight years with a wonderful team. Um, my team consists of a member of our clergy, Joan Killian, the Reverend Joan Killian, who happens to be on sabbatical now. Um, and then I am, I am in the director role. I have a program assistant who it happens to, I saw is on this call with us today. And then I have a wonderful commission of um, lay members that serve in, um, a three-year term with us. Um, we have about 15 members on that commission. Um, that serve faithfully and roll off after stagger kind of that three-year um, term. Um, and we really are very intentional about how we um, recruit and select those members so that they represent the membership of Christ Church in age and stage. Um, so we have young adults and parents of children and youth. Um, we have active retired folks. We have um, sages or what we call our, um, our very retired, maybe elderly folks at the church, but we have sages represented on our, um, on our commission. And we even have a youth representative, a teen representative. So we really do try to um, have folks that represent all ages and stages um, that have a passion for outreach and community. And um, we want to make sure we're hearing all the voices. And at our table, we have all the voices. Um, I, I have to say, we, we have a reputation of, of working with really great people on our outreach commission. And often the vestry then decides to take our folks. So um, uh, that's, it's, it's always interesting when it comes time for vestry selection because um, we recognize lots of folks that get selected for vestry from our outreach commission. Um, it has just been the greatest work I, I think um, that we do is to work alongside our lay folks. And um, you mentioned the grant process. We are a large, very well-resourced church and that is quite a blessing. Um, and we are able to put um, hundreds of thousands of dollars annually into the Charlotte community in grant funds. And so I would say that the largest bit of our work as a commission and a team is the allocations of those funds and the overseeing of those, those funds um, annually. Um, and, and our commission takes that very, very seriously. Um, we are organized, um, we have a framework. We, we mentioned a framework. I think that's a great way to think about it. That, that's kind of a newer way that we have um, approached outreach, um, the way we look at outreach. Um, just in the last couple of, of years, we've kind of moved to this framework of learn, act, advocate, meaning uh, you know, we want to meet our folks where they are. Um, some folks 
need to learn more about the issues that face our community. And so we really try to provide many opportunities um, to, to, to learn about the issues facing our community, such as um, um, housing um, affordability or a lack of housing affordability, um, economic mobility or, and um, educational equity. So we, we've formed pillars around the, the major issues facing Charlotte, reconciliation and, and social justice. Um, and so we, we provide opportunities for book reads or pilgrimages, um, discussion groups, uh, guest speakers, you know, just lots of opportunities to, to educate our, our parish. Um, and then um, opportunities to serve in our community partnerships. Um, those would be our funding partners um, that have volunteer opportunities. So um, we provide opportunities for action and um, that can be anything from a habitat build to tutoring with a child at the local elementary school that we support um, and, and many other opportunity hosting. Um, we have room in the inn, um, a, a homeless shelter type uh, program through the winter months and lots and lots of other ways. Um, and then, and what we're really trying to move our folks to is advocacy. Um, we we have a lot of folks in our parish that um, are have a lot of influence in Charlotte, and we're trying to help them move from action to advocacy in their spheres of influence. And so, talking more about that work and that that's a real important way to serve in our community. So, um, again, that's kind of the framework from which we we try to talk about outreach um, at Christchurch in these five pillars of, uh, pillars of housing stability and solutions to homelessness, economic opportunity and stabilization, children, youth and educational equity, reconciliation and restorative social justice, and our newest care and sustainment of God's creation. Um, as I mentioned that the, the folks that apply for grant funding um, and, it, and have to fit into one of these pillars. We ask when they fill out the application for our funding that they identify themselves in one of these pillars. Interestingly enough, a lot of them have crossover across the different um, the different pillars. Um, and um, so um, that's just kind of where we've chosen to lay our focus. That doesn't mean that we don't provide funding to organizations that don't necessarily fit in. Sometimes we have mental health organizations or um, health related or different different types of organizations. And we do have some other buckets that are outside of our, um, our annual uh, funding, um, uh, outreach funding like special gifts or holiday offerings and you see our Christchurch Foundation. So we do have other ways to fund those things, but when it comes to our mission funding and, and outreach funding, we do try to stay within those pillars. So that's just some ways that we've tried to organize ourselves. Um, and um, I hope that's provided some some sort of help for, you know, or at least some, some guidelines for how we do it here at Christchurch. Um, like I said, we do have a large budget. Our mission funding goes to two dioceses globally that we work with through the Diocese of North Carolina. So um, that would be the Diocese of Botswana and Costa Rica, where we have global partnerships. And we think of mission as anything outside of um, Charlotte and outreach as being anything that we support inside Charlotte. So um, I look forward Great. to answering any questions um, when it comes time. Um, Thank you. Andrew. Thank you, Laura. I really I appreciate it. And I, I again, I, you know, it's so helpful to see that, you know, how your framework and your structure, even, you know, the, the conception of, you know, mission versus outreach, again, just lets you organize how to engage people, where to engage people, how to allocate resources. So I think it's 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 really very, very in, in, important. So thank you, Laura. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Bill, I, you know, while on paper, you know your your parish and you know St. Anne's and and Christchurch might look a little on the different side. You all actually have a really very similar approach and yes, 
culture and structure and kind of way you're engaging folks in mission and outreach. So I, I think it's a yours is some, going to be some great sort of complimentary, you know, you know, lessons, you know, that we've already heard from from Laura. So tell us what's going on at at St. Anne's. Gladly, and thank you so much uh, for the invitation to take part in this, Marshall. It's a it's a privilege to be with you and Laura today, and and everyone who's joined us. Um, yeah, I was thinking that as Laura, you were speaking about, and then going back to your converse, your comment earlier, Marshall, about scalability. I think the the way that Saint Anne, as a as a much differently sized and resourced parish, has embraced similar frameworks. Uh, it just shows that this sort of approach can really be implemented across so many different contexts, which is what I hope will prove uh, intriguing or inspiring to anyone who has a chance to to have a listen to this conversation today. Um, but just to just to set that context for for Saint Anne, uh, we are in Westchester, Ohio, which is a northern suburb of Cincinnati. So we're in the diocese of Southern Ohio, uh, and I have only been the rector here for uh, just about nine months. So my, my my journey with St. Anne is, is in its very early days, but it's it's been a joyful, wonderful time of, of coming alongside the good ministry that this community has been doing uh, really for, for a long, long time in, in Westchester. Um, and St. Anne is also a very young parish. Uh, it was founded as a beginning as a house church in 1979. And then, uh, you know, the building was built in the 90s. And we still have people worshiping in our pews today who were there from day one. So, so that's sort of the context of how we're operating. This is a non-endowed parish. We, we raise and spend the money that we receive each year based uh, almost exclusively on pledges. Uh, and, you know, with the occasional grant, but uh, really this is, you know, we are, we are figuring this out as we go to year to year and figuring out how to prioritize uh, outreach and advocacy work within our sort of operational budget. So um, the, the note about becoming beloved community that's, that's on the slide, I think that's, you know, as is the case, I think, for so many of our, our parish communities in the past several years, especially St. Anne has really been trying to embrace and live into this call to becoming a beloved community. Uh, and that's manifested, I think, in a number of different ways, some of them more in the sort of education formation spheres, but also I see real, real indicators of it within the outreach and mission strategy that is continuing to evolve. Um, and when I say becoming beloved community, we obviously we're, we're most commonly talking about uh, sort of racial justice and healing and reconciliation efforts that fall under that sphere. But I think we can also think about becoming beloved community um, perhaps in a more holistic and broad reaching sense of just really thinking about how our discipleship, how our life as Christians is sort of uh, lived out as participants in systems. And how are we seeking healing and justice in systems as disciples of Jesus? And so I, I think that's the sort of journey that we're on at St. Anne to think more holistically about the way that we are showing up and participating uh, both within our community and then certainly out beyond it. So that kind of is leading into what, what I refer to here as this through line between giving and service and advocacy. And this really reminded me of what you said, Laura, about your sort of learn, act, serve, sort of guiding people, meeting people where they're at in their particular faith journey and, and what they're ready to do and coming alongside and encouraging, maybe taking the next step, the next deeper step into that engagement and encounter. So we have, the parish has long uh, made financial gifts to various community partners, agencies. And again, that's a line item in our operating budget. Um, and the the grants and gifts that are made through that are, are fairly, it's a, broad, it's a broad swath of, of agencies and organizations. Anyone can apply um, in the community or beyond. And then we have a, a group of folks who, who process those applications and meet as a group to discern and make decisions um, and that's done on a quarterly basis. But what we're what we're sort of, you know, thinking about is making more clear linkages between those gifts that we make and then the service ministry opportunities that we are also engaging in. So as we make gifts and establish new connections and partnerships with uh, folks out outside in the community, um, 
are there opportunities in those places to for us to also show up in person and engage in some kind of hands-on project? Um, and since I've been here in the past few months, I've, I've witnessed and, and been part of uh, seeing that unfold in a couple of different instances. And it's really cool when I think you start to see the synergy between giving and action and sort of the, the financial support, which is so important for so many of our community partners, but then us showing up as 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 church members, as Episcopalians, to sort of be there where the action is happening out in the community and to see folks make those connections uh, is, is really exciting. Uh, and then there's that, that even deeper step of sort of thinking about advocacy for uh, social justice, different sorts of public policy. We have a couple really incredible champions of uh, pushing us more deeply into that work here at the parish. Uh, and so we are definitely thinking more and more about how we incorporate those components into the same themes that may, we might be touching on in the giving and the service ministry aspects of what we're doing. Um, uh, an example I was going to point out about sort of what that through line could look like, at least in, in, in one instance for us, was last fall, right after I, I started here, we had a food drive. And that, you know, that's a great sort of, you know, very common thing for a parish to do. Um, and it was in partnership with a regional food bank, Shared Harvest. And uh, we have some par parishioners who are passionate volunteers at Shared Harvest. And so we started to think a bit more, I would say, uh, synergistically about how this could become more than a standard food drive. So we had the opportunity for people to donate food or to make cash donations to Shared Harvest. But then we also, um, you know, took, I think, sort of a further step into the sort of service. We organized a day of service where people could go and be involved in food distribution to families themselves at the food bank. And then we incorporated some formational aspects. So we had um, a representative from Shared Harvest come and give a forum presentation on a Sunday morning uh, to educate folks about uh, what their operations and also food insecurity in our region. We had tabling materials set up throughout the season about food insecurity, about the farm bill uh, that was uh, being considered by Congress at that time with some quick links and tips about how people could write to their representatives or advocate for for certain um, policies that would support people experiencing food insecurity. So trying to just sort of think creatively about how do all of these different parts of the journey and pieces of engagement fit together and maybe sort of organize them into one campaign that is um, sort of easy for folks to sort of wrap their heads around in a particular season. That's something that we're continuing to explore here. Uh, as we do that work and as we continue to grow into that work, we have this outreach commission. Again, this has been part of St. Anne for a good long while, and it has this sort of two, two-fold aspect to its structure. So we have a service and advocacy committee or commission. They meet monthly uh, that, you know, they're talking about service projects. They're talking about advocacy initiatives, especially ones that we might work with our diocesan staff on, on bringing up or implementing. We have a couple of those going on right now in this diocese. Um, and then we have that allocations committee that gets together and reviews the grant and funding requests. Um, we have sort of some membership that crosses those two so that there's a bit of collaboration and, and continuity across those efforts. And then we have a vestry member, a vestry liaison who oversees both of those groups and attends both of those meetings and then reports back to, to our vestry uh, about sort of some of the unfolding uh, ideas and projects that are being considered in those spaces. Um, the allocation program itself, just sort of a nuts and bolts aspect of it. We're, we're on a quarterly basis. Um, like I've already said, it comes from our operating budget and uh, it's an open forum application. It's right on our St. Anne Parish website. It's very simple, very accessible. Anyone could build such a form. Uh, we have sort of, we, we use Faith Connector as our web hosting, and it's literally just a, a function that was built into the website uh, that then goes directly to the chair of the allocations committee and a couple other folks so that they're notified by email when a funding request comes in, and then they meet uh, on a regular basis to review those, make those disbursements, and, uh, and then and go from there. So that's that's really that's really sort of 
where we're at, I would say, in terms of our structure and and our mission and vision as we're trying to to grow it. I, I just think that we're um we're we're really trying to live into just again that more holistic understanding of how our outreach and our mission, financially, service and otherwise, is not just sort of this one thing that this one committee does, but is really integrated into the whole life of our of our community and into our understanding of what Christian discipleship actually is. Um, and we're, so we're we're using this um, this area of ministry to start good conversations, to open people's uh, eye, eyes and hearts to maybe some pressing needs in our community, and then hopefully make those connections with how the gospel is calling us to to respond in these various ways. Fantastic! Thank thank you, Phil. I really I oh. really do appreciate it. Uh, before we get to the uh, sort of a, a conversation time. I do want to lift up a couple of other parish examples just to, again, toss you some other data points out there. The first of which is my own parish, Christ Church, Georgetown and Washington, D.C. Uh, a few things about our outreach uh, ministry program is we actually do commit, have sort of formally out loud said we commit, we tithe to outreach and community support um, each year. I think it's, you know, it's $130,000, $140,000, I, I think, and at, to about maybe a dozen or 15 different organizations. Some of the organizations receive a little bit more of our support, and there, there are a couple of groups that Christchurch actually helped to establish. So there's a history of kind of an ongoing relationship that's a little bit more, that's a little deeper than some of the others. But we use the marks of mission as a framework to, again, sort of structure how we're giving and, and, and how the mission committee uh, operates. One of the clever things I think that we do, we're a very, very liturgical parish, um, sort of medium high, depending on your definitions of that. Uh, and a lot of us who are liturgy geeks, I'm the actually the acolyte master at, at my parish as, as well as just a long a long time member. But we've got a fantastic staff who who is taken on to writing prayers like the one you see and weaving our partners, our mission partners and the nonprofits that we work with into our intercessions. And we're a big right one church. So our 1115 service is always right one. So hence you will see the language uh, that's more, it is in alignment with sort of right one language, but there are tons of these. And every week, again, it puts our partners and our fellow Georgetown congregations, as well as the things that we're doing up in front of, you know, every single week, people hear about what we're doing. And again, so we're not waiting till the annual meeting to tell everyone what we're doing and the organizations that we're supporting. And this is in addition to inviting the leaders of these organizations to come to our, you know, our education, adult education hour. Um, so again, a, a lot of ways, but I just wanted to lift up what my own parish is doing. And then lastly, go to the other side of the country uh, with with thanks to uh, EPN uh, board member Dwight Kahn, who's their rector, and Amanda Eep, who's their director of outreach, is Church of the Epiphany in Seattle. They have a, a different approach than ones we've talked about already. Instead of pulling something out of their ongoing operating budget, they host an annual event every single February called Have a Heart. And that's how the resources are developed for their nonprofit partners. It's a very grassroots um, sort of uh, democratic, but grassroots is probably the best way to describe it. If there's an organization, Christians has got a connection to an organization and their fellow parishioners who want to serve and volunteer for that, they can bring these groups up to the attention of the committee and they can add that to the list of the groups that get supported from the Have a Heart fundraiser. Uh, but as long as there's sort of ongoing support, so it's definitely not a top down, it's a it's a, a bottom up. And they work with a, a very wide range of organizations from, I think, Boys and Girls Club. They also support the Tiny Homes Movement. So it just all comes from where there was passion and interest. And then there is a structure that each of those organizations does have a parishioner representative that does maintain ongoing contact. So that regular check-in, how's it going, happens that way. And then those people are then represented on their, on their committee. They have so much going on with their mission and monthly service and outreach that they have actually created a separate uh, we, a monthly newsletter. You can see a little snapshot of it on the screen. Um, again, this is above and beyond their uh, their regular, you know, here's what's going on in Epiphany email that goes out. So again, just talks about what they're doing, opportunities to serve. Um, and I think it's just, it's really a great dynamic um, you know, parish is doing this. And I've, I've 
put a link down to to their work as well. So again, lots of different ways to approach this. Again, there's no one right or wrong way. I think it's just exciting to see the diversity of ways parishes of different shapes, sizes, and in different parts of the country can approach this. So I want to kind of do a little bit of just sort of conversation time. And one question did pop up, I did see in the in the chat, was to get, a, I guess, a little sense of scale and you know, how many nonprofits are being supported? As I mentioned, you know, at Christchurch, we're probably at around that 12, 15 or so. I may be under, that's around that kind of number. Um, Phil, your allocations committee, it, it, how many per quarter? It's, it's about a handful are, each quarter, right? Yeah, it's, it's a handful each quarter. I would say on average, it probably is about uh, five agencies or four or five agencies each quarter. Uh, receive receive some form of funding, and that amount of funding varies uh, for for a whole host of factors, depending on the request, depending on the money available. But generally, those grants are are you know in the somewhere between five hundred and fifteen hundred dollars each. Uh, right. So that that gives you, I think, a sense of the the scale of that budget for Saint Anne. Saint Anne is. Uh, I saw a couple folks asking in the chat, uh, the size of St. Anne, um, just we're, we're, uh, I guess a pastoral size parish, uh, so sole clergy parish, um, where our, our ASA probably is between 160 and 175 people. Um, and that that's been fairly constant over the past several years. Uh, so that, I think maybe that gives a bit of a sense of, of where, where we're operating. Right. Uh, Laura, so yeah, so give us a uh, I would yeah. love to give the op the other side of that. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, I, I was, no, no, please. Um, we um, through our out so our outreach budget um, allocates grants one annually, which we disperse twice a year, but it's just an annual grant to roughly uh, 23 to 25 organizations that fall under those pillar cat categories that I talked about. Um, they, the application is open to anyone. Um, they are, they can apply in October and grants are just for the, for the upcoming year. So, um, our budget, um, is, has been, it's based on our, our, um, pledge, our annual pledges. Um, and, um, this last year, our budget was four hundred and fifty thousand for outreach and thirty one thousand for mission. Again, mission was for out of out of Charlotte. Um, so that's for my annual budget, and that's what goes to the grants. And then, um, so the way we look at that, and and just from a scalability standpoint, um, we. Uh, one of our partners, a longtime partner, is Habitat for Humanity. We were one of the first churches in Charlotte. We were called the, one of the Jeremiah Six that 40 years ago brought Habitat to Charlotte with the Jer Jimmy Carter work bill. Um, and so we pay annually $75,000 to Habitat to build a house here in Charlotte. And so we're just completing that bill. So we do both volunteers and funding to build a house each year. Um, we um pay for a summer literacy program at an elementary school called freedom school partners that's seventy six thousand dollars out of my outreach but so we we have some very large scale grants that go out annually um and then we have smaller ones i would say probably our smallest um from the outreach budget are maybe uh, ten thousand from the outreach budget um and um we also have, like you mentioned, Marshall, we have many organizations here in town that Christ Church helped um, start years ago, you know, Crisis Assistance Ministry, Loaves and Fishes, um, Charlotte Family Housing, many, many of our local organizations that um, in early days, um, Christ Church was part of the original um funding partners to get those going. And so we kind of see those as legacy partners. And every year there's going to be a gift of sorts to that. We have, um, as organizations grow, we have 
reduced funding depending on the need and the size of the organization, which allows us to kind of bring in newer organizations. We always are thinking about being equitable and, and keeping smaller organizations in seedlings. We think of it as seedlings that can grow to big, mighty oaks. Um, and the last thing I want to say about all of that is that because we have our foundation, we're able to then bring other organizations that may not be on our annual outreach budget, but that we want to be able to give grant funding to. Um, we can we can provide funding through um, the the um, Christchurch Foundation on an annual basis that might not be as permanent or kind of long term yeah. as being an outreach partner. Oh, OK, great. Thank you. So yeah. Yeah. And, that makes that, yeah, that 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 makes it, it's a, a a great you know again you you all have a, a lot of different uh, different buckets but you're, you're, again you're, you're using them strategically. Uh, Christchurch Georgetown has similar you know we help to establish the Georgetown Ministry Center and so you know, they routinely get not only financial support but they also get a lot of activity whether it's the feeding ministries. Uh, GMC used to have a floating shelter during the winter which was suspended during. Uh, during COVID, but we were one of the locations. So there were, again, we do, where possible, include a lot of service activities as, uh, as, as well. Um, one of the things that, you know, so from, for our staff, you know, Parish, again, you know, it's a tie out of our operating budget, but we don't, we don't actually, you know, have an endowment that's focused solely on mission and outreach. We're actually in the middle of a large campaign, primarily to renovate our parish hall, but one of the goals of that is actually to establish a separate identified and designated endowment fund that will support our outreach mission that would add and build on what's coming out of our operating budget. It will, it's going to be a great opportunity once we get that, that funded, but for now, it's just coming out of our operating budget. Um, Phil, I know you have told me that sort of building endowment is kind of on your long-term radar. Tell me sure. about what, what does that vision look like for you or, how do you see that kind of fitting in long term to your parishes? Yeah, I, I, I think that I think that's a question that's still unfolding for for us uh, for a whole host of reasons, and and the the purpose and shape of what an endowment would look like at Saint Anne is still you know we're we're still discerning that. I I, I sense that as something that I'm going to have a role to play in helping uh, champion and and you know perhaps work with Vestry to guide some of those conversations in the in the coming year or two. But I will I, I have to say like as we as we talk about this, I'm blown away by what you all do in your in your contexts. But I'll say like for St. Anne, and maybe this will resonate for some of our folks listening in to this conversation, like our whole operating budget is more in the four hundred and fifty thousand dollar range. And I know there are so many parishes that are, you know, even uh, you know, have budgets uh more modest than that. But uh, and our, I would say, our line item for for making for making financial contributions, it has varied with the ebb and flow of our own budget, you know, ups and downs over the years. And Vestry has had to make some hard decisions in that regard. Um, but it, it probably it ranges somewhere in the fifteen to twenty thousand dollar per year range, depending on what our capacities are. Um, but I would also like I'm I'm also thinking about. For parishes that have a more perhaps a, a little leaner budget, you know, thinking also about the the value of the time and the labor that that is contributed by your mm -hmm. volunteers to these service organizations. If you're doing some mixture of service advocacy and giving, that that you could attach a value to that as well. So so don't feel overwhelmed when you hear about like big grant making programs yeah. of any scale. Like no matter what size parish you're in, like there even if you can only make a very focused gift to a just a one or two agencies in the course of a year, like that's still a really important uh, piece of discipleship because it allows <laughs> you to start building those relationships with the community that we've been that we've been talking about. Absolutely. One of the things that we talk about in the you know the foundation universe is it's called gifts beyond the grant. I mean, it's one thing for a foundation to say, okay, here's your check to a nonprofit, but it's now becoming a lot more of the the best practice to say, okay, yeah, here's your check, but here are connections we can make. Here's expertise. Here's things that we can do to be in relationship with you, our nonprofit or grantee partners. So. Again, I think, you know, Laura, you know, talked about sort of mobilizing what I, I think we refer to as the social capital. I mean, you've got people who are important and mobilizing that those relationships and those voices does have a value. And yes, to be sure, 
the monetary support is 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 very very useful. But again, these connections that are made, uh, you know, the voices that are lift up about these particular issues, I think is really very you know is critical. You know, a lot of groups do struggle with the term advocacy, and uh, you know, nonprofits as well. But I do think helping people to speak with you know clarity and, and articulately about a particular issue in ways that they can share or spread that word or talk about it with other people i think that's advocacy you know with the lowercase a you know people are like well they're you know i don't want to risk our nonprofit status no no it's really about helping people to talk about various issues um and i think both you know christchurch charlotte as well as saint anne have really done a great job of engaging its parishioners to talk about these issues and kind of threading that needle when you know the politics of it might be complicated to 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 be nice about it but i think it's it's uh it's been great to see one question and phil you've you've represented and actually laura you did well what's the role of the vestry in all this where where does the vestry and their leadership how does that fit into this laura how does your i can i can, I can answer that first of all I'm, i didn't mention earlier when i was talking about the makeup of my commission i do have a vestry liaison as well that's very active and then reports back to the vestry but the vestry determines our outreach budget mm -hmm. annually, um, and then then that's how we then know what we have to work with for the year. So the vestry is very involved. The vestry also um, sets a set of goals and priorities for us through the church, and we we work from our framework and our pillars. But we are always working through the vest the goals for the, that the vestry sets for the church. So. Um, we work in in conjunction with that. I, um, Phil, Phil, did you want to say something about that? Because there was a, there were two questions that I felt like I could give really brief answers to that I could uh, in the the chat that I felt. Yeah, like I know I some folks were asking about advocacy steps and some other maybe some other things as well. Um, I'll say briefly, our vestry similarly. They're pretty engaged. We have, like I said, that really robust vestry liaison structure, and that person is really the conduit back and forth um, to the sort of visioning conversations that are going on at the vestry, you know, the the whole vestry level. So we're, we're on a monthly basis now, we're having some different visioning conversations as a whole vestry about our role in the community, what these kinds of initiatives might look like moving forward, where are the gaps that we're perhaps, you know, needing to step into. So yeah, from a, from a visioning and strategic perspective, our vestry is, is super engaged as well. Um, in terms of advocacy, just dialing back to that, and then Laura might have other stuff, but um, specific things that St. Anne has done is uh, we uh, have had folks uh, present at coffee hour to engage in petition drives for ballot initiatives that are taking place in the state of Ohio. Um, we're really conscious about doing uh, those when they are, again, in concert with diocesan initiatives. Um, and part of that is because we are a politically diverse parish and there are a lot of different perspectives about certain issues of the day. And so we try to really align ourselves with diocesan priorities and, and, and initiatives so that we're sort of operating within that broader system. Um, we have also sent folks up to some ecumenical lobbying days at the state capitol in Columbus to sort of have some firsthand experience of, of engaging in advocacy in a face-to-face -face way with, with lawmakers. Great, thanks. Laura, you wanted to respond to a couple of questions that you saw in the chat. Well, that I will just tag on to what Phil was saying. Um, we um, also, you know, I, I feel like, um, first of all, I want to say that um, this Christchurch is a, a bit of an anomaly, obviously. I had not, I've never been in a church this well resourced, and it's a gift, and it, it's don't. It, we are doing the best we can with these resources, but it is not normal, I think, in most most situations. Um, that said, I, I'm really conscious and, and I really don't want us to be the, the ATM of Christ Church where we're just giving money out. And that's where we're, this advocacy piece is. Um, we're, we're really trying to help people understand that, that, that they have influence in this city and whether it's their passion is save the trees or save the children, their voice matters. And in their spheres of influence, um, writing a check is very important, but so is their voice and using their voice to advocate for whatever it is they feel strongly about. I mean, obviously we're, we're always leading from our baptismal covenant and, and the, the things that we are taught 
as Episcopalians and Christians to to um, care for. But I, that that's really where, where we are on advocacy. I often use things from from the um, uh, Episcopal Church's policy network. In my, I also have a. We also have a. Um, an outreach monthly monthly newsletter, and so it's a gentle way I can kind of encourage folks to um, read about opportunities to advocate um, or things at the state level. We we try to organize things at the state level that maybe our community partners are involved in, and and maybe it's a way of supporting our community partners. So that was that. The other que- the other question that I wanted to address is was about the supporting churches in other countries. Um, our diocese, I mentioned this earlier, has a very established relationship with two global dioceses: the Diocese of Botswana and the Diocese of Costa Rica. We take, we had prior to COVID, we're taking annual trips to Costa Rica for 20 years. We've been there. We have a very close relationship. I recently was on a trip with the diocese um, to, to Botswana as well. So we have close relationships with the Anglican or Episcopal diocese there, and therefore churches there. I have not, we have not engaged in relationships in my time with churches that were not, that were outside of the Anglican or Episcopal church. Um, But those have been really, really organic relationships because it's our people. It's just in different parts of the world. And we, we connect through relationship with those. I think it is so important. And when I was doing sort of the gathering information for this webinar, I was speaking to one of the clergy at St. Michael's and All Angels in Texas. She had actually been at a very, very small parish. I want to say it was either Alabama or, or Arkansas, you know, and just they were they were just out. She and the whole parish, they were out there in the community. So they were always at the table when the whether mm-hmm. it was the community foundation or any the leaders of the community. That look that parish church was always there. I mean, that they helped create a, I think, a food bank or things during the it was just it's amazing. But I think that this is really a, a great opportunity for the Episcopal Church to be present, to be out there. And so I, I really, I think as we can equip our members of our admission committee, the vestry, not just the clergy, to be out there, to listen and see what is going on in the community so they can bring that perspective back to the conversations at the parish. I think it's, you know, I, I mean, our showing up, I mean, that, you know, that shows how we order our lives and we can say, yes, I was, you know, this is where I am on Sundays, but I'm here wanting to listen to what you're doing, organization A or B, and we want to be out there. So again, I think that that's a, it is an opportunity uh, for us, uh, you know, through mission and outreach, again, whether it's volunteerism, advocacy, or financial support, it is a way for us to be present. And I think that's going to do nothing but help the church and help the church um, as it, as it grows. Um, I am watching our time and do want to be conscious of the time. And I know we're capturing a lot of the things in the chat, and we can certainly try to reach out to folks and you've got um, our contact information, uh, but I also want to respect the time that everyone is, is given to this. Um, I, I want to just, you know, first take a, just a minute as before I start thanking everyone again, just to wrap up some of the things that were brought up earlier, but the importance of having objectives and having some sort of a structure. You saw both with Christchurch and with St. Anne, how having uh, you know that that through line that that way to kind of organize the thinking and the giving and the engaging really has enabled them to build and sustain programs um there's a lot of work to be done and i think the more that we can do to help our mission committee members and vestry members to understand the needs and the issues of the of the community and understand how they can do the roles that they've been called to do and do that effectively you want to make sure that the process is understandable and keep everyone in, informed uh, you know, take the moments we've heard actually, you know, several of the groups that are that are taking that moment and kind of doing a strategic review. I know actually St. Michael's and All Angels is actually doing strategic planning for each of its kind of mission outreach, you know, focus areas so that they can take a pause and make sure that th- this is going the way they were expecting. And do they need to be making uh, making some changes? Um, I, I, again, want to thank so much, Laura and Phil, your valuable contributions and your willingness to participate in this. And I want to thank, you know, all of you all uh, who have joined in on this conversation. Um, I'm glad that the Episcopal Parish Network um, is doing this and putting this up and adding this to its amazing series of webinars. So there's so many resources on their website. And if you haven't been, I encourage you to go. Uh, I've left you with our contact information, you know, and please, you know, reach out to us 
uh, and I'm happy to connect you with the folks at some of the other parishes that I referred to. But, you know, Laura, again, thank you, Phil. Thank you uh, very, very, uh, a, a whole lot. It was great to meet you and work with you all. And again, thank you to Joe and to the Episcopal Parish Network uh, for its, uh, its great work that it's doing and do encourage everyone to look at the, the, the conference next year in Kansas City. So any other final little bits, Laura and Phil? I'm gonna let everyone go in a second. I think that's, I get to say goodbye to everyone, but any last bits? Just feel free to to contact me anytime if you have questions um, about how we do things. I'm happy to share. I, I, being transparent is just really how I how I do things here. So how we do things in outreach here. So would love to share our um, our successes and our learnings and um, fantastic kind of work together. Yeah. Thank you. Same. Uh, I put my email address in the chat if anyone has a question about how St. Anne operates things at this scale. And just remember that no matter what form of outreach or missional work you're doing, it is integral to our discipleship as followers of Jesus. And that's at the end of the day what we're doing here. Absolutely. All righty. Well, again, take care, everyone, and have a good rest of your day and week. And again, thank you for participating. And uh, EPN folks, I will let you all close out the session and stop the recording again. Thank you all for participating.